speaking uh, about guard your heart, and I'm going to continue on that this morning. It's something that, that the Holy Spirit won't let me away in my personal life. And you know, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you've got it all together. Have a little chat with Joanna this morning. She'll, she'll give you the wee lists of things that you haven't got it together on. But, but so you, I need to guard my heart. And, and you need to guard your heart as an individual. But, but also as a church this morning, we need to guard our hearts this morning. And the Holy Spirit is not letting me away from that. And, and so even if you don't listen to me for the next 20 minutes or whatever I'll be, you just remember those words for your own personal life. Guard my heart. That, that's all you've got to get. Now, I'm going to take a little while to say all of that, but, but that's the three words you need to walk out of this building this morning. And every day you wake up this week, you need to remember, guard my heart. Let, let's just say those words together. Guard my heart. Three simple words, but it's very difficult to do in life. The complete opposite is really easy. It's really easy to allow your heart to be overwhelmed. It's really easy to allow yourself to, to freak out and to faint. And hey, let's be honest this morning, each and every one of us have done that at some points in our lives. But the Holy Spirit is talking to us as a family and as individuals this morning. This is a time to guard our hearts. Amen. And so let, let's turn, so as we know the verse, and I know we all know it, but let's turn to Proverbs chapter 4. And if we put it up on the screen there for me this morning, please. And we'll read from verse 20, and it says, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings, and let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. You know, where you got to keep the Word of God? Inside your heart. you got to bury it inside your heart. And look what it says the Word of God is for you. For it's life to those who find them, and healing to to all their flesh. We could preach on that verse for a long time this morning, but we won't. But you, if you need healing in your body and in your mind or wherever you need healing this morning, then the Bible promises you if you will hide the word in your heart, it brings life to you and it brings healing to all your flesh, to every area of your life. In verse 23 it says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the spring of life. And I took about two weeks to talk about that verse. And it says, we read it in different translations, to guard or to keep your heart meant to watch over, to be careful what you allow into your heart. And I spoke about the influences that are outside our lives. You know, that your family, your parents, your, your wife, your kids, you know, friends, your work, employers, lots of things begin to influence us. And the Bible says that you have got to be careful what you look at, what you listen to, what you spend your time allowing into your heart, because what you allow in will begin to change the course of your life. Allow the negative things in, and negative things begin to come in your life. Allow the Word of God, allow the positive things to saturate and overwhelm your heart and guess what? Trouble still comes, but you're able to walk through the storm because you've got the peace of God inside of you. Amen? And you've got to guard your heart because everything that you do comes from it. Every area of your life, you see, how you re think, how you react, how you respond, how you talk, the, just who you are as an individual, it flows from your heart. I, I can come here with a mask this morning. I could come here with holy hands and do all of those things, but, but come spend time with somebody. After a while, you begin to see who the real person is. Their heart begins to pour out. The Bible tells us that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I can say nice words, but stay with me long enough, and suddenly what's inside my heart is going to come out. And if I don't like what's inside my heart, then the Bible says, I need to change it. And I need to guard what's there. I need to watch over and protect my heart. And we took a couple of weeks to speak about that. And I'm not going to recap that all this morning. But I want to continue on. And we're going to uh, look in the uh, Philippians. If you turn to Philippians chapter 1, and I'm going to call this this morning a letter of hope. A letter of hope. And that's what I've come to talk about this morning with you. A letter of hope. Now, we're going to look at a few verses in Philippians, but before I do that, I want to help us understand the backdrop or, or what was happening when Paul's going to write this. 
You see, when Paul, you can read it in Acts chapter 16, when Paul is going, uh, one of his first mission trips, he went into Europe and he came to the city of Philippi. And uh, Philippi was a, it was a Roman colony. It was quite a wealthy city. And many of the military men of the day, when they were done fighting, they retired to Philippi. It likes to be a holiday town and everybody was there. But if you read through Acts, you'll find that it was one of the first churches that the Apostle Paul founded in Europe. One of the first converts, not good news for us men, one of the very first converts, Apostle Paul, was a lady by the name of Lydia. The Bible told us her job, she was the seller of purple. So Lydia was one of the first converts. But also, and so we begin to understand that Paul has an affinity with this, this city of, uh, of Philippi, because it's the first church, it's his first con, uh, convert or first Christian that he's bringing into the family. But also the Bible says that they were walking through the city and there was a fortune teller. A lady would follow them and she would make a disturbance. And one day Paul just got fed up with this disturbance and he turned around and what did he do? He cast the devil out of the fortune teller. So there you go. If you're wondering today, a fortune teller is good. Just have a little read Acts 16. I think that answers that question nicely for you. And so he cast the demon out of this fortune teller. And then the men who owned her, they weren't too chuffed because people haven't changed Back then, is the same as are today. They wanted to know their future. They would have paid big money to get that. They were making lots of money off this woman. So they wanted to deal with uh, Paul and Silas, and they were arrested. And guess what happens? They're put in jail. And you read the story the same as I did. You sang the song in Sunday school that Paul and Silas, they're in jail. And at midnight, they're praying and they're singing praises unto God. And there's a large earthquake, a rumble, and the chains fall off. The doors fly open, and they're set free. But the jailer, he panics, thinks, Man, man, I've been told to look after these guys. These boys are reprobates. I'm going to get killed because these guys have escaped. But Paul says, no, we haven't escaped. We're still here. And Paul not only leads the jailer to family, uh, sorry, to, to Christ, but he also uh, brings the whole household salvation. Amen. And so we can see that with Paul, there's a tremendous relationship with this church in Philippians. Now, there's many, when you read and study in it, which I like to do, Philippians, when was it written? Many scholars, there's different views, but the most common opinion is that Paul was writing this when he was in Rome, and he was arrested, and he's in, he's in jail, he's under house arrest for two years. So think about the circumstances we're here. Paul loved to go out and to travel to churches. He loved to minister. He loved to preach the gospel and deal with all the reprobates, but he's in jail. Not in a dungeon, but he's under house arrest. He's still, he's locked away, and he can't go out. And he's thinking about his church the church of Philippi. And he begins to think about them, that that they're the the ones that I founded. They're the ones, and you'll read it in Acts 16, they're the ones who kept on financially supporting me and praying for me in the ministry. But now I'm in jail. Now I'm having a little bit of a story this morning, and please allow me it. But I can imagine reading between the lines. Just think about that church this morning. I'm sure Paul stood up and preached encouraging messages one day to the church that God's well able, that God will look after us. But what happens the day when the Paul who stood, that God will always deliver us, is suddenly in jail? And he wasn't in jail just for a little time. He's going to be in jail, and the expectation is that he's going to be executed. And yes, the church in Philippi, they love God and they're followers of Christ, but Paul had such an impression and an influence on their lives, and yet they hear the message that their founder and the one who's supporting and helping and encouraging them, and he's preaching the gospel. If God's going to look after anybody, it's the apostle Paul, and yet he is in jail. And we know the end of the story, but they didn't know the end of the story then. They're finally expecting him to be killed. And I can imagine that there's confusion in the church at that time. How how could Paul talk about a God who'll deliver, and yet he's in jail? How is the God of breakthrough, but your life doesn't look like to be in breakthrough? And I imagine the church was divided. Some said, well, God will turn it around. And others going, you're a Muppet. It's a disaster. We might as well forget it and quit. If it didn't work out for Paul, here, look at me in the mess of my life. This is not going to work for me. If God doesn't love Paul enough to help him, well, here, I might as well disappear. And the church is there. And Paul, in the midst of his own battles, in the midst of prison, and the thought of his own life being taken, sits down in a jail. And he begins to put pen 
to paper. And he thinks about a church and a congregation and a people that he loves. And he doesn't write, you reprobates, I've heard about half you fighting and all of this. No, no, he writes what I'm calling a letter of hope. He writes a letter of hope to a congregation who's confused and not sure what's going on, and he writes it. Now, let's be clear this morning. This is a letter that was written to a specific church. It was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in uh, Philippi. But who inspired uh, Paul to write this? It was God. Under the Bible says it, that this Word of God, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so he's writing that letter to a church in an actual time. But God's not limited by time. And although he inspired Paul to write those words to a church who needed hope in the midst of a storm, I also believe 100% in my heart that at that moment when he's inspiring Paul to write those words, he could see in the year 2019 in a little town of Craigavon and the church name of Family Center, and he knew everyone who would be sitting here, and he says, although I'm penning this letter to them, I'm also writing a letter to you. I'm writing a letter of hope to you in the midst of the storm. I didn't come this morning with an elegant little story or to manipulate with you with words because that is not what I ever planned to do. I came this morning with the heart of the Father to speak to me, speak to you, and to speak to us as a church of a letter of hope from Daddy. We need a letter of hope inside this church this morning. There are battles on every side. I've said it every week, and you don't need me to remind you. But there is battles here. And there is confusion, and there's disappointment, and there's frustration, and there's questions, the same as the church of Philippi had. And that's fine. That's the way life is going to be. But Daddy knew it, and he's writing, and he's speaking to you this morning. And he says, I've penned these words for you, and I'm giving you a letter of hope. Amen. And so I'm going to look at a few verses this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the entire book of Philip and, uh, and, and study that with you. I could do that. We're definitely not going to do that. We're about four verses and we're done. Look, it's only 12 o'clock. So let me speak about four verses and we'll get through this this morning. But uh, let, let's turn to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3 it says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I love this introduction from Paul. He, he writes to the church straight away and he says, guys, I want you to remember that although I'm in jail, I remember you every single day. I pray for you every single day. Why? Because you are my partners. You are my partners. And I also believe that that's the same way as the leaders of this church towards the family, but also the heart of our Father to us. He says, I have not forgotten you. Amen. I have not forgotten you. Every single day I think of you. You do not escape my attention. I remember you, for you are in partnership with me. You are heirs in God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Amen. In verse 6, then Paul writes this. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to the completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace. You need to underline that verses in your Bible. You need to meditate on that this week. He says, I am sure of this thing. And why does he say those words? Because there wasn't a surety in the church. There was confusion there was people not sure what's happening. Does, is God good? Does God heal? Is this going to work out? Will I be delivered? What is happening here, God? And Paul, even in the midst of a storm and in prison, he writes this thing, irrespective of what's happening to me, I am convinced Amen. that God 
who began this thing that's happening, God who began the good work, He will bring it to pass. And that's a word for us this morning, that everything that's been good in your life began with God. He started it. The Bible says that before the foundations of the world, Jesus was the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. Jeremiah says, before you were formed in your mother's wombs. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, we didn't start it. We didn't concoct it up. We didn't pray and make God do something. God moved before we did. And he began a good work. He started this work. Not our pastors, although they're the founders. God God started this. Amen. God saved you. God's already delivered and healed you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And he started a work. Now, if, if you come to my house, you'll see half finished projects. Neil's quite good at starting something, but he's not quite good at getting it over the line. I mean, who wants to have a picture fully straight when it can look good artistically? Half, half straight. But God is not like the rest of us men. He, when he starts something, he brings it to pass. God doesn't say, I'm going to start healing you. And halfway through your healing, go, act the pot with that. I've got a bit tired with this process. I'm out of here. Sure, half healed is better than not healed at all. No, when he begins something, he brings it to pass. And that is what we need to hear this morning. When God has begun a good work in you, Point at yourself this morning. God has begun a good work in me. He's begun it in you, and he will bring it to pass. Paul had no reason. He had no right to be sure of that. He's in prison. He's going to be executed. Life hasn't worked out the way it should. In other words, he could have been more convinced that, well, here, this has all been a lie. I mean, we've all been duped here. Somebody's preached all this stuff to me, and, and my goodness, they've just manipulated me for years. The pot with this, I'm out. No, he says, even though life doesn't look good, I am still convinced what God told me is true. Amen? And that's what I'm speaking over this house this morning. What God has told us is true. Amen? We need to believe that. I like that what he says in verse 7. See, the Bible really goes, it's right for me to feel this way. Why did he write those words? Because he knew when they read the letter out in the church, people thought, Paul, he's been in a wee dark cell for far too long. He's gone cuckoo. Paul, how can you be sure and feel this way? But he says to them, it's right for me to feel confident. And why? Because he says, we are all partakers in grace. And you can be confident this morning, not in you, not in your ability, not in you trying to earn something from God, not in you trying to manipulate and coax God into doing something. No, you can be confident this morning that you are in the grace of God, highly favored, highly loved by God. Then God gives us what we don't deserve. He lavishes on us. He gives us every single thing. The Bible says that he has already delivered us from this present evil world. Amen. Praise God. Now, I hope you're getting inside and inside your own heart. But it is good this morning. That's a good verse to start. I'm confident of this, that God who began the good work will bring it to pass. And let me tell that and prophesy over that, this church this morning, that God, what he has started in this family, what he has begun in this church, he will bring it to pass because of his goodness and his grace. Amen. And so let's jump on to then um, in verse 18, Philippians 1 and 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. And look at verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Amen. That's a key there. I want you to underline that in your Bible this morning or highlight it on your phone, whatever way you're going to do it. But he gives a key this morning of why he was confident. He says, I, I may be in jail. I may not look as if things are working out, but I am confident that I will be delivered. I I'm confident that this is not going to stay the way it is. The storm may be here and problems may be here. And he didn't deny his problems. He says, I I'm in prison. I need delivered, but I'm confident one day I'm coming out of this. I will be delivered. 
And how did he know he'd be delivered? He says to the church, through your prayers and through the Spirit of God. And church, those are two keys for us this morning. This is not a time to walk away from the Spirit of God. Amen? This is not a time to say, God, I'm not sure if you're good. God, I'm not sure if you heal. I'm not sure if you love us. I'm not sure you're going to help me. I'm not sure do you, do you choose to help this person, but not that person. Or maybe it's, it's dependent upon me and me being holy. Or they, no, no, no. This is not a time to doubt what the Bible says. This is a time to be immersed in the presence of God. This is a time as a church to say, we need this presence of God. I need the Spirit of God in this house. And need his power and his ability here. Amen? Amen. This is not a time to turn our back on God. We can have our questions. We can have our frustrations. But this is a time to run into the presence of God and stay close to the Father. And he said, God's strength will help me, but also your prayers. And let me remind you, church, this morning, we need to continue to pray. Amen? And let me also say this, prayer works. There are many this morning who will tell you outside of this building, act a pot with it, this prayer gig doesn't work. We prayed and they died, we did this. Here, I, I've seen good and I've seen the bad. I, got, I haven't got all the answers this morning, but I choose what the Bible says. And the Bible says that the effectual, heartfelt, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its work. And that's the amplified version. In simple words, when you get close to God and you pray, things happen. Amen. And I, I know this morning, I could sit and I could cry with you this morning. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I know I've got stories that could make you cry too. But the Word of God says that prayer works and prayer changes things. And he was reminding the church of Philippi, it is not time to stop praying. It's not time to back down and quit. The presence of God is here. He's going to deliver me. So you keep praying. And that's a word to us this morning. We've got a battle that's in this house. We got people that's facing life and death situations, not a headache and not think. We got problems in the house, but we've got the presence of God in the house, and our responsibility is to continue to pray until we see the breakthroughs happen. Amen. And I think you can tell this is burning inside me this morning. We got to continue to pray, and that's okay this morning. It's okay this morning. You think Neil, I can't do that. That's okay. You're my brother and sister, and I love you with all my heart. So you just stand close with us. But, but please, please don't go and try and condemn your other brother or sister. If you're in a place this morning, you think, I'm not sure if this works, just go and talk to daddy. But let your brother or your sister who's believe in God, let them fight the battle and just stand quietly beside them. So let's go on to verse 27. Um, uh, chapter 1 and verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and I see you or I am absent, I may hear, and hear what? That you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. What a word this morning. And that's a word for us this morning, church, that we are in a battle and we have got to stand firm on a strong foundation that says we are being battered on every side. But this word, the Bible says that forever your word has been established in heaven. It does not change. Life hits us and it wallops us, but this doesn't move. And we stand firm on the word of God and refuse to be shaken from what the word of God says. And it says that we stand firm in one spirit and with one mind. Church, we have, but we need to continue to have unity in the house not a time for division, not a time to fall out with each other, not a time to be critical with each other, but we need to look at each other and go, you're my brother and sister in the Lord. We may not have the same views on everything, but we're in a battle together and we are going to stand. And look how it says, standing side by side. Let me tell you this morning, you are not alone. 
I appreciate you may not get a phone call every 33 seconds. You may be awake at night crying in pain, but let me tell you this, you are not alone. As a family, we are standing this morning side by side, and the Bible says that we strive Strive. Strive's not a word that means we have a nice wee dander together. We walk along singing a wee happy song. Strive means we fight ferociously. We push forward. We knock back the enemy. Amen. And we're, stri- we're fighting. What are we fighting for? The faith of the gospel. I'm tired of putting on a, the, the TV and the social media that begins to say God isn't real. This gospel doesn't work. The healing's out. Forget it all. We are fighting not only for our light, we're fighting for the message of the gospel, the true gospel that God is a good God and he's a healing, miracle-working God. And it tells us in verse 28, and don't be frightened by anything of your opponents. We could have fear this morning. Cancer is a big word. Divorce is a big word. Anxiety and stress, torment, they're big powerful words and the enemy screams at us and we would have every right in the natural to fear but the bible says that if god is for us who can be against us and we have no reason to let fear paralyze us this morning now you think neil you're still in chapter one would you get on with it yes look i've missed chapter two we've skipped all of chapter two it's a really good chapter read it when you go home but it's not what i want to pull out this morning and look at that chapter three we're only going to do one verse or two verses chapter three so chapter three verse 13 everyone knows this verse brothers i do not consider that i have made it on my own but one thing i do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead i press onward toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of god in christ jesus amen we know that verse this morning forgetting what lies behind and straining forward that's a message for us this morning that we need to remember you see i don't think it means forget wipe from your memory don't have any recollection you know get electrical shock therapy and get it gone i don't believe it means that this morning but what happens in our lives we have disappointments and frustrations and what does it do it puts a chain around our legs it it binds our heart it binds us and rather than moving forward we stay still or even worse we retreat and so i don't think it's saying forget your problems and forget the things because we need to remember the troubles and remember that god delivered us out of them we need to remember all those things but remove the chains and the weights and the things that are holding us back everything that says it's over it's finished you'll never come out of this we need to forget the lies of the past forget the lies of the past and move forward and what are we moving forward to we're moving forward to seeing the physical manifestation on this earth of our healing seeing ourselves delivered but look at the words it says we strain forward and we press forward anybody who told you this would be an easy gig they didn't give you the full picture apostle paul said i'm straining forward study that word there's lots of different words uh, and meanings but i like this one we fight vigorously and we press forward you know what i don't know about you but i've told you this before like i see pictures and every time i read that verse i press toward the goal i always see myself in a jungle i don't know never been in a jungle don't know why that comes to me but i can see a jungle and there's trees and there's bushes and there's everything and it's very very thick and it's pushing towards me and says you ain't coming into this jungle well i then see myself in my nice wee you know cap and all i've got on and i got a sword and i just don't stand the sword and go now out of my way there we a bush no no i gotta take that sword and whack all my pressure to get that bush out of my way and then i'm taking my shoulder and i push on in and as i press in i got past this one but suddenly another bush stands and says you may have got past him but you're not getting past me and i got to keep whacking through and that's the mental image i see and that's the same in the spurt that when we go to fight in against cancer against sickness and disease it pushes back violently at you 
but you have a sword this morning. The Word of God is our sword. And we press forward. And we knock the enemy out of the way. And it's not easy. And it's not a little 30 seconds and a quick, nice wee prayer and let's get on with it. No, no. We fight vigorously until we see the breakthrough. Amen. Amen. I'm on the last verses now. So chapter 4 and verse, verse uh, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's a good verse. Amen. I rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. That's a good promise this morning. God is in the house. He's in control. And he's going to see you being delivered. Amen. And so verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. You need to put your, your, your name this morning. You just need to read what it says. And it says, you know, Hannah, don't be anxious for anything. Diane, don't be anxious about anything. Ali, don't be anxious about anything. But it's easy to be anxious. It's easy to be worried. It's easy to freak out. We all do it. Why is the Bible telling me don't be anxious about anything? And it says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. I could speak on that verse for quite a while this morning. I'm not. But you know what? Look what the Bible said to do. And we'll talk about this maybe a few other weeks' time. It said, let your requests be known unto God. Let me read the Bible the way we read it. Be anxious about everything. And everything by prayer and supplication and grumbling, let your problems be known unto God. That's how I read my Bible. I'll go in, I'll just be honest with you this morning. This time I'm going to pray for five minutes. I'll go in for the five minutes prayer and say, God, got this problem. This is what the doctor said. This is what the wife said. This is what I'm thinking. My Aunt Sally, she had that. Uncle Fred down the road said that. The news said that. They haven't got a cure. I'm freaking out. God, if I die, what's going to happen to the kids? What's going to happen, uh, Joanna? What's going to happen on? And I'll spend 40, uh, 45 minutes and five minutes. How am I doing that? Uh, in five minutes prayer, I'll spend four minutes and 50 seconds saying, God, it's a nightmare. It's a problem. da 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 Well, my five minutes is near up. Here, God, you wouldn't mind doing something about that. Thank you very much. And now to go. And that's the way we pray. We make our problems known unto God. But the Bible says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. In other words, God, I come before you. You're an awesome God. You're a miracle working God. I rejoice that you've delivered me before. You know, and I'll say that I say it's you praying, you know I've got cancer, but God, I thank you that you're bigger than the name of cancer. I thank you that you're a miracle working God, and this is only a name and it has to go. And I thank you that you're going to heal me by your stripes, and I'm getting delivered. That is how we pray. We make our requests known unto God with thanksgiving. The Bible tells you that before you tell him your need, he already knows your need. He knows your problem. He knows the difficulty. You don't need to say, now God, I need you, I need you, to, I need you to, this is top priority. I know Gareth's got a problem there, and that's real tough if Gareth's got that problem, but God, my, my problem's slightly bigger than him, so if we get the answer to me first, and then you can roll on to Gareth. God doesn't need to, he doesn't need your direction, doesn't need your wisdom, he doesn't need to know about the problem. He says, you put your request. And the word request means demand. Now, I've just quickly spoke about that. We could do that. I'm going to tie it all up. So don't be anxious for anything. In everything, by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And here's how we tie it up. And the peace of God. So you're anxious. What is anxiety? No peace. Freaked out, stressed out, grumpy little... Oh, I nearly said a bad word there. A grumpy little bad boy. Uh, be anxious for nothing. Have peace. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. You have no right to have peace. You have no right to be not freaking out. But he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Look at the next part. Will guard your hearts. How did I start this this morning? I said... The Bible said to guard your heart, to watch your heart, to protect your heart. 
And how are you going to protect your heart in the midst of the storm when the storm is shouting at you? He says, you come to me, you make your requests known to me, and you thank me. And as you do that, I'll pour into your life the peace of God, which passes all understanding, and I'll guard your heart, and I'll guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen? And verse 8 says, finally, brothers. Now look at that. He said finally, but he, he wrote like about 12 verses after it. Anyway, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I told you week one to guard your heart is be careful of what you let influence you, what you let yourself think about. This is not a church where we talk about denying our problems or pretending they're not there. We acknowledge that there's a problem, but we deny its right to remain. And it tells us here, don't be anxious, pray to God, he'll give you peace. And whilst you wait on your breakthrough being manifested here, he tells you what to do. Don't sit and think about your problem every night and day. Don't talk about the problem continually. You do need to acknowledge it. You do need to speak to people. You need to talk about it, but not continually. He says the things that you need to think about is what's ever lovely, what's ever honorable, what's ever true. And let me help you this morning. That is the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God is true. It's honorable. It's just. It's pure. It's lovely. It's commendable. And by Jove, it's excellent. Amen. And we need to think of that, and it's worthy of praise. And the last verse this morning, in verse 13, Paul just tells the church, finally, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, he needed to remind himself, I can. I am well able to do all things through him who strengthens me. And that's for you this morning. You can come through this. You can beat this. You can and you will be delivered and have it, not for your own strength, but through him who strengthens us this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's just stand to our feet then this morning as we get ready to close our service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, Lord, Lord your word promises us that when the word goes forth, that it, it will produce a harvest. It doesn't return unto you void, but it accomplishes what it's been sent to do. So the first thing I say, enemy, this morning... I refuse to allow you to steal the seeds of hope that have been planted this morning. Many will take the word and run with it immediately, but there are others, it's just an embryonic seed. So we protect the good ground this morning, and I pray the seed goes down inside their hearts, that this is a letter of hope to each and every one of us this morning, that it will begin to grow inside our hearts. And this week, as we think about this word, it will begin to germinate and begin to grow and begin to produce fruit inside our own hearts first in the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you for the promise of your word this morning, a letter of hope to our hearts that tells us that you are for us, that you are not against us, that you are our strength, you are our fortress, you are our strong tower, you are our deliverer, and that we can do all things through you who strengthen us this morning. Lord, I take authority over every stronghold, every anxiety, every worry, every spirit of fear that holds us back, every lie of the enemy that tells us we're not coming through. I tear it down in the name of Jesus, and I lift up strong in its place the name of Jesus that is above every name, that at that name every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. Lord, I thank you for the promise this morning that we do not have to allow anxiety and fear to paralyze us this morning. 
For in your presence there is perfect love, and perfect love casts out all fear this morning. So, Lord, we come to you with our request this morning. I thank you that you're an almighty God. You're a miracle-working God who, when you died upon Calvary's cross, you won the victory for us, and you delivered us from this present evil age. And that thanks be unto God who always, always, always causes us to triumph. And Lord, I pray that you put inside of us that warrior spirit. As we talked about last week, David had to get onto the battlefield. We step onto the battlefield today with a sword of the spirit in our hand. And we press forward, pushing back the enemy and pressing forward towards our deliverance. And Lord, I thank you that the peace of God, the presence of God, the joy of God, the hope of God, the strength of God would rule and reign in our hearts by one Christ Jesus. I thank you that our hearts are being guarded this morning. I thank you that we celebrate the victory together and we stand with each other until we get into this place and we dance a jig and celebrate as we see healings, breakthroughs, deliverance and miracles. And we praise you for everything you have done and continue to do in the mighty, victorious, powerful, healing and delivering name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We see you tonight then at 6.30.